There are a few ways manipulative people get you to do whatever they want. But the easiest, most effective and least suspecting strategy of manipulation is Generosity To explain how manipulative people get you to do what they want using this strategy, I'd like to tell you an interesting story. It was the year 1853. The 17-year-old Andrew Kaneji was working as a messenger boy for the O'Reilly Telegraph Company. And I'm the official messenger boy, I am. His salary was $2.50 a week in the beginning and later $20 a month, which was a lot better than his first job in America. But there was a problem. The telegraph messenger job was one of the most ridiculous jobs anyone could have because what you did essentially was to run around the town delivering messages to people. Fortunately for Kaneji, he met a man named Thomas A. Scott who offered him a better job. On February 1st, 1853, Scott hired Kaneji and made him the manager of his telegraph office with a salary of $35 a month. The young Kaneji was happy not knowing that he would soon encounter a situation that would end up being the most regrettable event of his life. Scott loved Kaneji and treated him like a special boy. You're a good boy? Even took him everywhere, raised his salary, supported him like a father, and when in 1856 Kaneji wanted to invest in stock for the first time, Scott advanced him the $600 he needed. Now, this is where I'm going with this story. By 1870, Kaneji had become one of the richest people in the world and then his old boss turned to him to return the favor he did him. Return the favor. Between 1871 and 1872, Thomas A. Scott developed an interest in investing in the Texas and Pacific Railway Company. Andrew Kaneji didn't believe in Scott's idea but Scott forced him to invest a quarter of a million dollars. Kaneji couldn't say no because he felt that he owed him. You do me a favor, I owe you a favor. People say yes to those they owe. They just say yes to those they owe. Every member of every human culture has been trained to play by this rule, proposal that you have. But then, on September 18, 1873, calamity struck. J. Cook and Company, one of the biggest banks in the U.S., failed. This failure then set off a financial panic which resulted in the failures of many other companies, including the Texas and Pacific Railway Company, which Scott had gotten a lot of loans for. And now, once again, Scott turned to his boy, Carnegie. In the late September of 1873, Andrew Kaneji was invited to a meeting in which Scott pressured him for another financial support. In that meeting, Kaneji was asked, Won't you stand by your friends? Would you let your friends get ruined? Unfortunately for Kaneji, all his money at this time was tightly invested in different projects so he couldn't help his former boss. But he felt guilty for this incident all his life, according to what he wrote in his 1920 autobiography. And that's what manipulative people want you to do to feel guilty. First, a manipulator notices that you have what they need or that you can be of help to them in the future. Then they draw you closer to themselves with their generosity and then they shower you with attention, gifts, money or even something as simple as praise so that at the right time they can ask you to return the favor. Time to return the favor. Return the favor. You can return the favor. But you wouldn't just give them back what they gave you. Usually, you have to return their favor a thousandfold, which is how they achieve their aim. So the real reason why this manipulative strategy works so well is because of the phenomenon psychologists call the principle of reciprocity. I'd like to introduce you to the principle of reciprocity. This principle says that people feel obligated to give back to you the form of behavior you first given to them. In his 1984 book, Influence, American psychologist Robert Caldini wrote extensively about the principle of reciprocity. In the same book, Caldini cited many scientific studies in which people felt compelled to give back in hundredfolds what someone had given them in the past. In the book, Caldini wrote, and I quote, The rule says that favors are to be met with favors. According to the law of reciprocity, 
you are compelled as a human to do to others the kind of things they once did for you. For example, if one of your uncles paid your school fees when you were in high school, one day you'll be compelled to pay for his children's school fees. If one of your parents loved you so much when you were a kid, you'll be compelled as an adult to want to pay them back. But it could be a lot more trickier than that. For example, if a supermarket gives you something for free, you might be compelled to buy from them. Reciprocity. People want to say yes to those who have given to them first. There was a recent study that showed when customers came into a candy store, if they were given a gift of chocolate at the beginning, they were 42% more likely to buy in that store because they felt obligated to give back to someone who had given to them. If a company asks you to take a sample of their new product for free, you might feel guilty until you buy from them. If someone in a business meeting pays for your drink, you might be compelled to do business with them, even if their offer isn't the best for you. Listen to this. If one of your friends lends you $500 to start a business 15 years ago and today that friend needs $500,000 to start his own business, the principle of reciprocity states that you'll be compelled to give him the money if you have it. So to understand how this works, let's see generosity as a bait. A fisherman digs the ground to bring out a worm, puts them into a bait and throws it into a river. But he's not wasting the worm. He instead throws away this to get this. Be careful. There are many manipulators out there and the strategy is simple. They offer you free lunch. They buy you things, they give you attention, show themselves to be nice and generous. But one day they'll ask you to return the favor. And this is not to say that you shouldn't accept free lunch from people. Of course, a few people truly care about you and even if you have to pay them back, that shouldn't be a bad thing. But you have to pay close attention to free lunches from sources you don't trust. For example, if you're having a business meeting with someone in a restaurant and both of you drink wine while talking, make sure you don't allow them to pay for you. You pay for them instead. If you're attending a family reunion, even if you have many rich uncles and relatives, don't go with the excitement of getting so much from others. Instead, plan to give little things to many of them. If you go shopping with a group of friends, if it is possible, don't let them buy you anything. Buy them something instead. It doesn't have to be an expensive shoe or a designer bag. The principle of reciprocity works even if you buy someone a candy. The idea here is simple despise free lunch instead give a lot of free lunch to people around you even to strangers plant your seed into your farm plant also on other people's farms plant during the season and out of the season spread your seeds of kindness generosity and love and it will work for you the way worms work for the fishermen you don't have to be a manipulator to do this you can have the same result as a manipulator by genuinely loving people for example, praise the person that did something nice for you and he would want to do more nice things for you. Give attention to someone who is lonely and he wants to give you something back. If you have some extra money, give a reasonable part of it as a free gift or loan to people who have shown themselves to be diligent the way Scott did for Kaneji in 1853. Give also to the people who won't ever give you money in return. Even though these people won't ever pay you back in cash, they will give you a good name, which is sometimes more valuable than money. For example, in 1528, Pietro Arentino left Rome for Venice, where some people already knew him as a writer. When he got to Venice, Arentino decided to build a brand for himself to attract the most important people in the society. His strategy was simple. He opened his door widely and allowed ordinary people to come to his home where they eat and get entertainment. When Arentino walked on the streets, he would give money to beggars, often, and poor women. He extended his gifts to nobility too. For example, to the Marquis of Venice, Arentino sent sculptures and swords. Before he knew it, words started spreading that in fact, Arentino wasn't just a writer but a very influential person, maybe a king somewhere, since the only kinds of people who were as generous as that were kings and nobles. In no time, the richest people in Venice wanted to be Arentino's friends. Rich merchants came to him with gifts. Dukes and duchesses gave him presents. He didn't just get monetary gifts, he got other favors too. For example, when Arentino's friend's son-in-law was sent to jail, 
the Marquis of Venice released him because of Arantino. So, in conclusion, it's difficult for me to be certain that Thomas A. Scott was manipulative. In fact, it didn't have to be manipulative for him to get Andrew Kennedy to invest a quarter of a million dollars in his project and feel guilty when he wasn't able to do more than that. It's a natural law within humans. If you get a worm from me today, you'll be compelled to give me a fish tomorrow. This doesn't mean that you should stop accepting worms from everybody around you. It only means that you should be more careful. Reject as many free lunches as you can. Give free lunches instead. Give praise. Give attention. Give smiles. Give your time. Give money if you have any. The more free worms you can give to others, the more fish they will be compelled to give to you.